That is. Hi there, and merhaba to our Turkish friends. Well, that's a rainy summer day here in northern Germany, Lower Saxon. I'm in Hanover, you know, there's some kind of very small park here. Anyway, I just want to tell you a story today. Well, it's a story about two men, Hassan and Hamid. So, but before I start with that, I have to tell you something else so you, you understand uh, the story, so you have a better understanding of all these two men. So, German and Turkish relationships are very old. They go back 500 years. So, I think it all started in 15 29 uh, with the first siege of Vienna and from that point so contacts uh, were hostile at first so that was a natural thing because well these two empires so German Roman Empire and Turkish Empire so that what what we call the Ottoman Empire um, well, these two empires were the biggest, most important empires of their times in Europe. It was a natural thing that during their expansion, uh, there was one point when they collided. And that was in the 16th century. And from that point on, there were many hostilities. And not only hostilities, also trading and a little bit of cultural exchange, but that was very little. So these empires, they, they didn't knew much about each other. So, and then in 1683, there was the, the very famous Second Siege of Vienna. And this is where our story begins. So Hassan and Hamid, these two fellows, uh, they served in the Turkish army. So, in the Ottoman Empire's military. And they took part in the siege of Vienna as combatants. And as such, they were kept during the siege. And yeah, they, they became prisoners of war. And as prisoners of war, they came here in the region of Hanover and they served in a noble's family household. So you have to imagine that, uh, what, what that means. So they were treated with great respect by the noble, noble family. And yeah, we know that from different facts. So one thing is they were allowed to stay in their religion. So, and to do all the rituals needed for that. So, this is a big deal for the 17th century, end of the 17th century. So, servants in a noble family's household, near the family, the children, and so on, former hostile combatants, former enemies, um, yeah, in your household. So that means this noble family, they must have trusted these two fellows, Hassan and Hamid. And they were treated with respect. So I think these two things, they belong together. So trust and respect. And after they died, and that was in, in 1691, after they died, the noble family uh, gave them really pretty and very expensive, obvi obviously expensive gravestones with a nice inscription. So 
in German and Turkish. So on this inscription, which tells the story of Hassan and Hamid, how they came here and so on. And uh, yeah, and from that point on, these graves uh, were treated uh, with respect. So until today. So in the beginning of the video, uh, you have seen these two gravestones, and there is also a little plate um, that tells the story of uh, Hassan and Hamid in Turkish and German. So you see these relations are quite old. So and from that point on, there were, were also yet trading exchanges. So hard to imagine uh, coffee houses of Vienna today without these yeah, these first contacts even if they have been hostile so but from that point on there was a cultural exchange too for coffee for tobacco for trading and so on so yeah that's the little story of uh, Hassan and Hamid so these graves are well known uh, even today here in Hanover and sometimes I come here when there's a when there's better weather than today and there's a nice day and just sit here having a smoke and you know, thinking a bit about Hassan and Hamid what they might have expected from their lives and yeah what these guys might have been through and yeah, what may may their thoughts have been to be here and so on. Yeah. Okay. So, one of them was very religious, and perhaps he was the one who told the noble family how to think, do things right after they are dead. So, because they were even buried with great respect, so in Muslim tradition, so direction to Mecca, and they try to do everything uh, as it should be. We don't know if it was very exact because, as I said, it was the end of the 17th century. So they, they didn't know so much about these things. But perhaps Hassan told them uh, how to do things right. Yeah. And that brings me to another point, uh, second point. Tobacco. So tobacco exchange from that point on yeah, that was, you could perhaps even say, a usual thing to do. So, Mershon pipes, tobacco, and so on. And today, of course, Turkish tobacco, this is famous tobacco. Uh, we all know that. But when we think about Turkish tobacco, we mostly think about Balkan blends, and a special kind of oriental Turkish leaf. So, but today I want to show you something very, very different. So true Turkish tobaccos, two, two true Turkish tobaccos, and yeah, there we have them. I'll just show, show you the pouches. <laughs> well, you see there are nice pictures on it. Government tries to, yeah, tries to bring us to, to smoke a bit less. Anyway, so. One of them is called Turk Pipotitini. So um, this goes back to the 1930s. So you see, it's a very traditional tobacco. And they do it uh, with the same production processes than they did it in the 30s, in the 1930s. So the tobacco is pressed in very huge pressings, wooden pressings, in very traditional ways. There are not many producers today um, using this, uh, this kind of pressing method. And they are very proud of it. And the second is the Yailadak. The Yailadak. I don't know if uh, my pronunciation is right, so excuse me for that. Um, anyway, two tobaccos. Uh, I show you the tobaccos, um, but first, let me say these are broken flakes, and 
they they look quite similar, I think. So I'll get this open. So this is the Turk people to do. So that that only means Turkish pipe tobacco. Turk people to do. I hope the camera works. So that's the that's the Turk people to do. And the second, the Yaila duck, I show you that one too. We have it here. Also a broken flag. So hope you see that. Yeah, so these tobaccos are quite special. So the Turk people to know this is 100 percent Turkish because the tobacco just comes from Turkey, so from different places uh, in Turkey. So Izmir, uh, Bitlis, uh, Yaylalak, so from different uh, places in Turkey. So and the leaves and the tobacco itself is not quite comparable to, to the terms we normally use, Virginia, Burley and so on. So if I if I should describe um, how it feels, um, how the texture is, and um, and anything, I think uh, if you know the Solani uh, Silver Flake, that is pretty near. So the tobacco feels very humid, a little bit moisty, and even a bit sticky. And, the, and this, this is related to the production process because they use a watering uh, for the fermentation. But it's not some kind of molasses, let's say, McBarren uses. It's very different. So when you smell the tobacco, first thing you will smell is honey. So both tobaccos um, yeah, are quite honey-like. And it's not a little bit honey, uh, let's say, many, many people say McBaron has a honey note. Well, that's nothing uh, compared to this tobaccos. Uh, they really have a huge honey note. And second thing is, you will smell different spices, fruits, uh, yeah. It just, just smells like a delicious Turkish candy. And there are differences, of course. So, the Yaladak, they use, uh, for the Yaladak, they use a pack mesh for the watering, for the fermentation, and so on, as some kind of molasses. And pack mesh, this is a traditional Turkish syrup. And it's based on grape mainly. But there are other ingredients, fruits, spices, and so on. So, for me, the Yaladak, uh, which I have now in my pipe, uh, the Yangla Duck um, is mostly honey and pack mash, but for me also a little bit like apricot. I don't think there's apricot in it, but that's what it tastes for me, what it smells for me. And the two people to do is honey and mainly fig. I think that's what I can uh, smell. And they say there's fig in it. So you gotta like that or not. Uh, these are aromatics, you can say that. And you have to imagine that these were governmental tobaccos. So, yeah, they go back to a time where only one tobacco was sold and this was Turk people to Tuni, so Turkish pipe tobacco. So, and for that, this was a time when we here in Central Europe, we had things like Caporal or Simois. So compared to that, this is really ambitious stuff. Really ambitious stuff. And it's delightful, even today. So it's, it's, it's really delicious. Uh, if you like aromatics and if you like honey. So if you don't like any honey, so that wouldn't be something for you. But if you do, you should give it a shot. So the Yaila Dark, 
is also combined with 24% of imported Firecurt Kentucky. And now you may guess which one is my favorite. <laughs> so, the Yale Duck, of course, because yeah, I love the Kentucky stuff. And, and you can taste the Kentucky. So give some extra spiciness. Um, yeah. You may like the Kentucky or not, so but it gives a little extra. Yeah, tobacco comes quite humid. So some say it's even a bit too moisty. So I don't know that. For me it's alright. So but I use a, uh, I use a immersion arm for that, so immersion arm that my immersion arm can easily handle uh, the humidity, so there's no problem with that. But you can give it a little bit of drying, so some people do. That's that's okay. Um, well I don't think you really have to because well, smokes pretty well. So especially the Yala Duck because the Kentucky the Kentucky likes to be a bit uh, a bit moisty or has a bit humid more humidity, so that's okay for the Kentucky I think. Yeah. So if you got the chance to get your hands on this stuff, you should give it a stuff. Uh, you should give it a shot, excuse me. So because this is interesting stuff and yeah this is very unique. That's what I think. But it's rare and it's very hard to get. So I spent some time in Turkey and was even for me when I was there very very difficult to get this stuff. So I stayed in a small town, it was impossible to get it there. So I have good friends, they provide me with that. Um, so this tobacco, nearly forgot that, that was very kindly given to me by Oz. So he is a fellow YTPC member and uh, yeah, he asked me, so should I send you one? And I already knew the Turk people to Tunisia and knew it was it's great stuff. And so I was very interested in the Yala Lak too. So thanks a lot, uh, Oz. And thanks a lot to other Turkish fellows um, who offered me um, to, to send uh, some stuff. So normally my, my students uh, or friends, they go to Turkey and um, they bring it for me. But it's only possible when they stay in Istanbul or Ankara and, and they know where to get it. Because even in Turkey, it's not easy to get. So a website uh, of to, uh, Tobacco Turk, that's the producer, uh, the new producer, they, but it's a new producer, um, but they produce it in, in really old-fashioned ways. So they stick to the tradition and they, they do it uh, like this tobacco was done before and before that. So um, they say on their website, it's available and they say it's, uh, there are even more different, uh, b different varieties uh, available, but I couldn't get them so far. I don't know. So it's not easy to get, but if you got the chance, uh, give it a shot. So, I think that's it. So guys, Hope you have nice weather. Hope you are well and take care. Gulu gulu and perhaps see you again. <laughs>